All right, um, I'm going to get started because I've got a lot of material to cover today. Um, my apologies for that, but I want to I jam a lot into this workshop. Um, I'm going to start with some very basic stuff, and, um, and then things will move on uh, and, and get a little bit more specific. If some of what I'm presenting is stuff that you feel like you absolutely know, just stick with it. We'll get to the other stuff that you don't know in a minute. Um, Everything that I'm going to be talking today about, is, it's, it's a little different than the kind of presentation I normally do. I don't normally do a branded workshop like this. But today's Tropic Marin, so I'm going to actually be able to talk about Tropic Marin stuff today. I want to thank Leo Debrayen uh, of Leonardo's Reef and the Apulia Reef Tank owners in Italy uh, for some of the photos that you're going to see today. Beautiful, dramatic coral photos. Um, that, these, that these folks have given me the, um, the go ahead to, to go ahead and share today. Um, this first one is one of them. Uh, our part one today is going to be all about calcium and alkalinity addition. Tropic Marin has many different ways to do this. And so we're going to talk about what happens in a reef tank. Why do we need to make calcium and alkalinity additions? The tank that you're looking at right now on the left-hand side of this slide is a tank that I want to show you because this was a guy that two and a half years ago could not keep a coral alive. And it just shows that once you start to understand what is needed and why it is needed, because it's not enough to just understand that you need to add something. You need to understand why you need to add it so you can figure out how you have to massage that addition um, and what is the best way to add those things. Because there's no one single bullet. There's no one solution. Um, there's no pill to take that's going to work in everybody's tank. There's one thing I've learned in the over 25 years of being with Tropic Marin, it's that everybody's tank is different. And so if you call me and you say, oh, I'm having this problem, how do I, how do I solve it? I'm probably going to ask you a million questions before we get to the solution because your tank is your tank and your tank is going to tell you what those solutions are. You just have to learn to understand how to translate what your tank is telling you. But one of the biggest things you can do in reef keeping is to learn to listen to your system because it will tell you what it needs but it may be in a slightly different language that you're going to have to learn. So we're going to start with some of the basics. And one of the most basic things is that polyps use calcium and carbonates to build their skeletal structure. So you may have seen this in one of my other videos. I'm going to go through it again for those of you that haven't seen it. And just quickly, here's why we have to add calcium and carbonates to our systems. Uh, here's my coral polyp. Yeah, it's not really a coral polyp, but it's going to represent my coral polyp today. And out in the water column, I've got ions that are carbonate ions and calcium ions. Now, one of the important things to understand is that calcium doesn't float around your tank like this for the most part. It's a charged ion. It's going to bond to something. So there's a lot more calcium out in this water column than what you're seeing. All I'm showing you is a snapshot in time of the calcium ions that happen to be free at the moment I'm looking at this water column. Okay, and it's important to understand that the calcium doesn't float around like this. It's constantly bonding to stuff and letting, letting go and bonding to something else. That's what makes a fluid a fluid. We've also got the carbonate ions here and those are the things that are also bonded, but again, I'm showing you a snapshot. All right, so the water floats around, and with the help of the zooxanthellae, yes, I'm oversimplifying, with the help of the zooxanthellae, the coral polyp is gonna find a carbonate ion and a calcium ion, and it's going to have a pair there. And it's gonna take that pair, it's gonna form calcium carbonate, and it's gonna deposit it at the base of the coral skeleton to help form that skeletal structure that the polyps live in. 
Now this process is going to continue. You can see that it keeps finding pairs and keeps depositing them down at the bottom to build that coral. This is how your coral grows its house. If we take all of that calcium and those carbonates and deposit them here in the base, and frankly, that purple stuff that you see is meant to represent that whole coral skeleton, you can see what happens is that out in our water column now, those calcium ions are not as prevalent. Neither are the carbonate ones, because we've taken them out and we've, corals made a skeletal structure. So this is why we need to constantly add calcium and carbonates or alkalinity to our systems, because the corals, if they're growing, are constantly using them. If your system's using a whole bunch of calcium and no carbonates, something's not right. If your system's using a whole bunch of carbonates, which is much more, much, I see that much more often, and not a lot of calcium, something's not right. There's a lot of reasons that that can happen, but you need to figure that out because your tank is crying for help. You need to understand that and then fix the problem, okay? All right, now there's another relationship that goes on between calcium and alkalinity that's interesting that we need to understand, which is that there is an inverse relationship between the calcium and the alkalinity in your tank. If we increase the calcium in the tank, the alkalinity is going to decrease. If we increase the alkalinity in the tank, the calcium is going to decrease. There's nothing you can do about the fact that there is this inverse relationship. If one's high, the other one's going to be a little bit lower, and that is true of both of them on both ends. There are things, however, that happen that influence where this ratio happens. For instance, if we have a tank that has super high magnesium, now, I've heard about people that um, are trying to get rid of bryopsis, and there's a lot of talk on the internet that if you raise your magnesium really, really high, your bryopsis is gonna die off. May be true, it may not be true. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but it may be true. What those people never tell you is that if you've raised your magnesium up to 17, 1800 to kill that bryopsis, you better get it back down because you've ruined this situation of where this calcium alkalinity ratio happens. All of that magnesium in the tank doesn't adjust the ratio, but it adjusts where the ratio happens. Everything is higher now. So during that period of time that you've raised your magnesium up to 17 or 1800, you need to make sure that you have more calcium and more alkalinity in your system until you can do water changes and get it out after the bryopsis goes off because your, your corals now are not getting what they need during that period of time. A more prominent thing that I see a lot more often is that this also has exactly the same um, presentation if you have an extremely high phosphate level. What's interesting about this is that the mechanism of the phosphate making it happen and the magnesium making it happen are actually reverse. Um, but I'm not gonna go into that today. What's important to understand is that if your phosphates are super high or your magnesium is super high, for whatever that period of time is before you get that resolved, you need to raise your calcium and your alkalinity at the same time. So we've established now that corals need calcium and carbonates. So we have to give it to them. How many of you, don't be, don't be shy now, how many of you use two-part additive in your system? Wow, I don't believe that. I think there's more. Anyway, there's a problem with two-part. And if you, if you stopped by my booth, I asked you to come here so you could learn what the problem with two-part is. I'm going to explain it to you. The, the problem with two-part is twofold. The first part of the problem is that it works. The second part of the problem is you don't, you don't know if it's working as well as it can. So let me explain to you chemically what the problem is with the two-part system. Sorry, I gotta let that slide go. I, I like those, I like those uh, polyps. And it's cool colors, right? I did not adjust the colors of those polyps. All right, 
So here's the problem with the two-part system. I'm oversimplifying a little bit because the two-part system that you are using may be slightly different and have some additional additives in it, but it doesn't have everything it needs. So what I'm doing is I'm simplifying it to emphasize this point in a way that you can really understand it very simply in a quick explanation. In the most basic form, your A part or your one part of your two-part additive is calcium chloride. Your B part or your two, number two part of your two-part additive is sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate or some combination of those two things. All right. What happens is the calcium from the calcium chloride and the carbonates from the sodium carbonate or bicarbonate they're going to get together in the coral polyp with the help of the zooxanthellae, just like we saw in the first diagram, and form that calcium carbonate matrix. They're going to end up down in the coral. They're gone. That leaves us with the chloride and the sodium. There is nothing you can do about the fact that if you start with sodium chloride and you get rid of the, chloride, uh, get rid of the sodium, you're going to be left with the chloride. It's not going to evaporate. It's not going to disappear. You're left with it. Same thing with the sodium, sorry, the calcium chloride. Same thing with the sodium bicarbonate. Get rid of the carbonates. You're left with the sodium. Now, in some ways, this is very convenient because chloride and sodium have a tremendous love affair. They have a tremendous affinity for each other, and they create sodium chloride, which is salt. 70% of what's in your tank is sodium chloride. So you're not creating anything dangerous. You're not creating something toxic. So now, of course, the question is, what's the problem, right? Well, here's the problem. As you add more and more two-part to your system, you're going to create more and more sodium chloride. Now, sodium chloride is part of what creates your salinity measurement. But it's not everything that creates your salinity measurement. In its simplest form, you're measuring what's floating around in my H2O that's not H2O, right? There's a lot of other stuff there besides the sodium chloride. Now, I'm going to use my hands here. Some of you have seen me done, do this explanation before, but my left hand is going to be my sodium chloride hand. My right hand is going to be everything else that's in sea salt. This is all the stuff that your animals really need. Potassium, molybdenum, iodine, all of that good stuff that you want them to get, all those trace elements, and some of them like potassium that we don't even consider a trace element, that's in my right hand. Now. Let's say this line right here is 1.025 salinity. Maybe it's 1.026. It's wherever you keep your system. That 1.025 is made up of 70% sodium chloride and 30% other stuff. The majority of what's in the other stuff is magnesium. But there's also all those other things. All right, 70, 30, 1.025. Now, with this, I add a bunch of sodium chloride. It's like I take a couple of spoons of sodium chloride, pure sodium chloride, and add it to my tank. What happens to my salinity? Anybody? Somebody yell it out. What, what happens when I measure my salinity now? Right, it's gone up. So what am I going to do? I'm going to add a little RODI water to dilute it and get it back down again. The problem is, I don't dilute just the sodium chloride. I dilute everything. So now the average of these two things gives me my 1.025 reading. But it's not 70-30 anymore. Now it's like 75-25. I'm exaggerating. The point is, if I have more sodium chloride at the same salinity, I must have less of everything else. Does that make sense? All right. In time, this makes a huge difference. 
It doesn't happen overnight, but in time, it makes a huge difference. Can you be successful with two-part? Yes. Are you successful as you will be? Maybe not. So there was a guy by the name of Hans Werner Balling that in 1994 solved this problem. He solved it with something called the Balling Method. So let's talk about how Balling solves this. It's really quite simple. Here's our coral polyp. I got a nicer one this time. It actually looks like a coral polyp now. Just like a two-part, we're going to have a part A, which is calcium chloride. And just like a two-part, we're going to have a part B, which is sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate or some combination of the two. What Balling did that was so brilliant was to say, let's add a part C. Part C is going to be everything else that's in seawater, but no sodium chloride, and I don't need any of the calcium and the carbonates because I'm getting those from the part A. So it's everything else that's in sea salt. Now, how does it work? It works like this. Just like in the two-part method, the calcium and the carbonate's going to form calcium carbonate and head down into the coral skeleton. That still leaves us, just like the two-part, with the chloride and the sodium, which, just like the two-part, is going to form sodium chloride. But now, instead of the sodium chloride building up, I'm going to calculate how much of that other 30% do I have to add to balance that sodium chloride. Now, the sodium chloride plus the part C, the sodium chloride that's left over, plus the part C, is perfectly balanced sea salt. So instead of putting a scoop of sodium chloride in my tank every day, I put a scoop of sea salt. Now, with, back to my hands again. Instead of doing this and this and this and this and keep depressing my trace elements, I'm going to do this, but in the bowling method, I've also done this. Now when I dilute it, I dilute everything and I'm right back to where I started. I have no residual. It's all gone. That's the beauty of the balling method. But there's more. And the more is this. And this is the part that's really hard to get your head around. So bear with me and stop me if you don't get this part. Because this is the part that everybody misses. The first part's easy. With your part C, you're adding mostly magnesium. You're adding all 70 trace elements. You're adding some of the minor, you're adding all the minor elements like potassium. But you are not supplementing for the used trace elements. You are adding magnesium. Let's take magnesium because with things like Balling Plus and three-part method that people talk about in relation to balling, they always talk about magnesium. So let's talk about magnesium in relation to this. The magnesium in that part C gets diluted when you dilute back to 1.023, uh, 26 or 25. So you're not supplementing. You are adding magnesium, you are adding trace elements, but you're going to dilute everything you add back to where you started. So technically, even though you're adding them, you're not supplementing for used magnesium. Then everybody says to me, well, can I just add more part C and then I supplement my magnesium in my trace elements? Not really, because they're not in the right proportions. There's very little magnesium in there. It's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to add trace elements separately. Tropic Marin makes trace A and trace K. Now, you can, by the way, add the appropriate amount, appropriate amount of trace A to the balling B, to the alkalinity solution, and mix it right in, and add the appropriate amount of the trace K to the balling A solution, the calcium part, and mix it. 
so that when you're dosing your three parts of your balling method, you're also taking care of your trace elements. There's no place, unfortunately, to put the magnesium. That you have to add separately with a product like biomagnesium. But you can get the balling method to do your trace elements by adding the trace K to the B and the trace A, uh, the trace K to the A and the, the trace A to the part B. Okay? Does everybody understand how you're adding those things, but you're not supplementing for the stuff that's used? Okay. So with balling, you've got advantages and disadvantages. And the reason I'm going through all these is because there are advantages and disadvantages to all of these methods. There's no right way to do it. By the way, if you want to use balling, Hans Werner Balling is in our lab. He's the head of our product development and we're the only company in the world to make balling products under his direct supervision. So if you want to use balling, you want to use Tropic Marin. So there's a lot of successful ways to do this calcium and alkalinity addition. We've talked about balling, and now we're going to talk briefly about biocalcium. Biocalcium is essentially the balling method in a single dose. So if you take the powder that you mix up the A solution for balling and the powder that you mix up the B solution for balling and the powder that you mix up the C solution for balling and you take the proper proportions and you mix it all up in a bowl to a single powder, that's biocalcium. So it is essentially the balling method. The downside to the biocalcium is you lost the ability to tweak the amount of calcium or alkalinity going in. Now we get to some new, interesting, newer developments. Carbocalcium. Carbocalcium is based in calcium formate. It comes as a liquid and as a powder. It is a single solution that doses both calcium and alkalinity in an extremely concentrated form. There's no byproducts. There's no sodium chloride that's left over so it doesn't screw up the ionic balance of, the, of your system. So you don't have to make those accommodations. Um, I wanna make sure that everybody understands that the difference between our carbocalcium and our alpha reef from other single part additives out on the market is that most of the other single part additives on the market are based in acetate, calcium acetate. And the amount of biological activity that happens when you add calcium acetate to your tank can actually get to a dangerous level when it comes to oxygen consumption. Calcium formate has a fraction of that and so there's, it's, there's no issue with the oxygen consumption when you're using a calcium formate product. Now, carbocalcium was an interesting development, but when we realized we could put calcium and alkalinity, supply calcium and alkalinity in a single solution, we realized we also could put trace A, trace K, and magnesium all in the same solution. That ended up as all for reef. So now in all for reef, you've got one single solution that doses calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, and trace elements. So what's the downside, right? Like, why wouldn't we use that? We'll talk about that in a minute because there's advantages and disadvantages to all of these methods. By the way, in both carbocalcium and in all for reef, the alkalinity component depends on the formate being metabolized by bacteria to form the carbonates. So if you add carbocalcium or alpha-reef to your aquarium, you're going to see the calcium level go up right away. It goes right into solution. But you're not going to see the effect that it has on alkalinity for a few hours, maybe a day, in some systems, maybe even two days, because it depends on that bacterial activity to turn the formate into 
the carbonates that are eventually going to register. The cool thing about that, by the way, is that your coral polyps would much rather get it in its one of its individual forms in the, um, that, the, that the bacteria is converting and while it's metabolizing. And so much of the alkalinity in carbocalcium and olfarif actually bypasses what you see as carbonates in your water column and goes directly to your corals. So, so you wanna start, when you're using either of those products, you wanna start with everything at the right level. And what you will notice in many cases is that you're adding your carbocalcium, your alkalinity is not dropping the way it used to, but your corals are still super happy. And that's because the alkalinity is going directly to the coral polyp, never going out into the water column and getting used from there. It's a kind of an interesting back door that happens. All right, so now the question becomes, which one of these things is best, right? Like, wh which one should I use? Why should I use one over the other? There is no best. It all depends on the way you want to run your system. So let's look at these different methods and talk about why you might want to use one or the other. So the first one we're going to talk about is original balling. Now, the disadvantage of original balling is you need three solutions. A lot of people hate that. You got to have three different dosing pumps if you're going to automate it. That's why I have a red arrow. It's a negative. However, you do have the ability with the balling method, as you do with the two-part, to adjust for differences in your alkalinity uptake or your calcium uptake. You can't do that in the one-part solutions. So that's a big plus. If you have one of these tanks that uses a lot more of one or the other, that's a good way to do it. By the way, keep in mind, if you are using carbocalcium or olfarif, and one or the other thing lags behind a little bit, your, your alkalinity is getting used a little bit faster, so your calcium is at good value, your 440 or 450 calcium, but your alkalinity seems to be dropping down, a little balling B fixes the problem. You just add a little more alkalinity by adding a little balling B, and you'll bring that alkalinity back up again. So that's the way you can adjust in those single solutions, but it's a whole extra process, so it is a slight bit of a negative when you're talking about balling. Then there's the biocalcium. Well, absolutely, um, you've lost now all control over your tweaking without getting another product because it's all a single powder. One of the nice things is it's a single powder. You're only adding one thing. And now we get to a yellow arrow. Some people like the fact that they're adding a powder to the tank. But you cannot pre-mix biocalcium into a single solution because the carbonates and the calcium are both in that powder. So if you try to pre-mix it into a concentrated solution, you get a brick. You get a calcium carbonate brick. So you can't pre-mix it. It must be added as a powder to the flow in the refugium or the sump or a good flow in the tank itself. Some people see that as a negative. Some people see it as a positive. That's why I put a yellow arrow, because I don't have, the jury's out on that one. Now we've got carbocalcium. Downside, single solution. No ability to adjust without another product your calcium, your alkalinity ratio. Super concentrated. Big upside. You're going to use about, the average reef tank uses about 5 milliliters per 26 gallons per day. 5 milliliters per 26 gallons per day. Not a lot. Single solution for calcium and alkalinity, big plus. I'm using one dosing pump, I'm dosing both things, and I don't need a third pump to adjust for all that extra sodium chloride. Also, by the way, because carbocalcium is so concentrated, you can also add the appropriate amount of trace A and trace K directly to the carbocalcium so that you have a single solution now that's dosing calcium, alkalinity, and trace elements. You could add the magnesium, but if you're going to add the magnesium, you might as well go to the alpha reef. So then the question is, well, why would I add the trace elements and not the magnesium? In a larger system, what I find is that the magnesium demand can be very variable. The magnesium demand is not proportional to the calcium alkalinity demand where the trace element demand is. 
So it makes a lot of sense in a larger system to use the carbocalcium with the trace elements added. Now I've got a single solution doing my trace elements and my calcium and my alkalinity. And then I can do my magnesium separately and add more or less as my tank needs. The reason it's okay in a smaller system is because if you've got a 10 gallon system, you can do a five gallon water change and correct half of the imbalance of your magnesium super easy. You're not gonna do a 50% water change in a 350 gallon system. So on larger systems, I like to see people use the carbocalcium with the addition of the trace elements and then do the magnesium separately. Then we get to the alpha reef. Downside, no ability to adjust now the ratio of calcium, alkalinity, trace elements, or magnesium. We added another factor in there now that we can't adjust. Advantage, super concentrated, also about five milliliters per 26 gallons per day. And now I've got a single solution that's dosing calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, and trace elements for me. One dosing pump. I'll tell you guys a secret, because we're, we're coming to the end of our first part of my, my workshop here. I'm gonna tell you a little secret. People love Alpha Reef. And I get so many calls from people that started using Alpha Reef and said, say how amazing, it's, amazing it is. I don't think it's actually the calcium and the alkalinity that's giving them the success. A lot of those people have never added the proper trace elements to their system. And now that they're using Alpha Reef, they're automatically adding the right trace elements to the system and the trace elements are making the difference. And I see this time and time again. So the trace elements in the carbocalcium is also really helpful in those larger systems. Any questions about any of these four products that I can answer for anybody? At the end, I'll take questions again, but if somebody's got a burning issue, I'm happy to help. Yes? Um, the, the 1,600 gram carbocalcium will make 10 liters of solution. And if you want, I can get it for you in a five gallon bucket. <laughs> any other burning questions? All right. I'm gonna take a little swig of my apple juice since I couldn't find water. We'll get on to carbon dosing. By the way, at the end of the workshop today, I've got a box full of those. Hopefully everybody's got a, a raffle ticket. If you don't have a raffle ticket, get one out of the back. I don't know if Dennis, uh, Kevin is still there. He is, um, he'll give it to you. Um, and I'm gonna wrap, I'm just gonna pick numbers. I've got a professional test set here is gonna, gonna go, a couple of our up, the, the top of the line salt that we make, and I've got some uh, carbon dosing products as well that we're just gonna give away on raffles. So if you don't get a raffle ticket, go get one. All right. There's lots of different ways to carbon dose. And I don't wanna be negative about any of them but there are ones that work better and reasons that they work better than others. And so I wanna go through it with you. Before we start talking about the products of carbon dosing, I want you to really understand what carbon dosing is, how it works and what it does in your system. So here's an ultra simplified form. Here's our coral polyp again. Now there's an interesting thing about our coral polyp. Our coral polyp has a very, very good effective mechanism for taking nitrates and nitrogen compounds, it actually doesn't want the nitrates, it wants the nitrogen compounds, out of the water column. It's got a really good mechanism for doing that. Unfortunately, it doesn't really need the nitrogen compounds as much what it really needs is the phosphates, and it's got a lousy mechanism for getting the phosphates out of the water column. There just isn't a good reason. We actually understand now more about why that reason is what it is. It's really looking for more of a particulate form of phosphate. But if you stop down on my booth 323, I can tell you more about that. We have a couple of new products coming out. 
It's got a lousy way to get phosphates out of the water column, got a really good way to get nitrates out of the water column. It needs the phosphates way more than it needs the nitrates. Now we have bacteria in the tank. Like it or not, your tank has tons of bacteria. Some of it good, some of it bad. We're gonna focus on the good guys. Now the interesting thing about the good bacteria is that it has an amazingly effective mechanism for taking the phosphates out of the water column. It also happens to have a lousy mechanism for getting the nitrates out of the water column. It's exactly opposite of the coral polyps. So here's our uh, happy little bacteria. And he's gonna help us out. He's gonna swim around the tank and he's going to eat a bunch of phosphates because he's got the ability to do that and our corals don't. And here's our coral, oh, sorry. He goes around and he eats all these, this phosphate and that brings the phosphate down in the water column. We see the, the phosphate level go down in the water column because he's eating it. This is what the carbon dosing does. The carbon dosing promotes the growth and multiplication of all this good bacteria that has this amazing ability to eat phosphate. And so it eats the phosphate. There's more of that good bacteria, more eating the phosphate, and the phosphate level goes down. Nutrient reduction. All right. Now we go back to our coral polyp. Remember our coral polyp? Lousy mechanism. But he's a filter feeder. So as this bacteria with all this phosphate inside goes floating around the tank, our coral polyp is gonna suck it in and eat it. And that ends up with all the phosphate now inside of him. Now I wanna, I wanna just point one little guy out. You'll notice the very top of the screen on the right hand side, there was a bacteria that got away. I put him there to represent our protein skimmer. <laughs> he unfortunately got sucked into the protein skimmer and he's out. So we didn't get his phosphate in the coral polyp. So the coral polyp has eaten all of this bacteria. It's got all this great phosphate now inside of it, which is what it really wanted. And by the way, because the phosphate is inside the coral polyp, it's not out in the water column, our level is still low. We still have that maintenance of that low nutrient uh, benefit of the carbon dosing. But now what happens is this, the coral polyp is super happy now. He starts multiplying like crazy. I should say she, right? They start multiplying like crazy. So the coral polyp, now that it's got the phosphate that it needs, starts growing. And depending on what type of coral you have, maybe we're looking at coral growth, maybe we're looking at extra little polyps on our, on our uh, sticks that we have, who knows, but they start growing and multiplying. And now, remember we talked about the fact that the coral polyp has a wonderful mechanism for taking the nitrates and the nitrogen compounds out of the water. If we have more coral polyps and those with coral polyps are happier, that's gonna drop the nutrient nitrate level in the water column. That's why when you carbon dose, you see the phosphates and the nitrates both decrease. Okay. So Tropic Marin's approach to this is quite different from most of the other companies. Most of the other companies make a product for carbon dosing. You use it, nutrient levels go down, you're good. The Tropic Marin products are built on regulating your phosphate level. You all have your little charts in front of you. I'm gonna put one up on the board. All right. The first two products I'm gonna talk about are at the bottom center of your chart. The NP Bacto pellets and the Refactif. These two products can be used at any phosphate concentration. High, low, doesn't matter. They're very gentle forms of carbon dosing. The Refactif in particular uses longer chain marine polymers from seaweed. Now here's why I love the Tropic Marin approach to this. Most of the good bacteria and algae that we wanna grow in a tank 
don't have the ability to break longer chain polymers down to the monomers that they need. They need single carbon. They need monomers. And they don't have the ability to break those chains down. The good guys, the guys we do want to grow, do have that ability. So if we put vodka or vinegar or sugar in our tanks to carbon dose, it's going to carbon dose. But it's going to carbon dose the good guys and the bad guys because the bad guys don't have to break those down. They're already in the form that they need. If we give them longer chain polymers, the bad guys can't get access to what they need. And the good guys can break it down and get what they need. What I love about the Tropic Marin line of carbon dosing is that it's all built on longer chains rather than monomers. And most of the other products out on the, on the market are built on monomers. So we're not going to target everything. We're not going to give everything what it needs, good and bad. We're going to skew the usage of the carbon compounds that we're putting in to the good guys. Uh, Refactif and NP Pacto pellets um, can be used at any level because they're very slow release. They're very, very mild forms of carbon dosing. NP Bacto pellets are used in a fluidized bed reactor like other uh, pellets that are out on the market. <clears throat> the interesting thing about using a pellet reactor to do carbon dosing is that you want to keep the flow. We in the US are always talking about maximum flow in our filtration. How many times do we turn over to tank volume? When you're doing fluidized bed for carbon dosing, you want to use the minimum flow that keeps all of the pellets fluidized. They'll, they'll tend, if you have the flow too low, to stop fluidizing in the very bottom, and then they'll glue together. You want to use the minimum flow that keeps all of the pellets fluidizing, <clears throat> and um, that flow will probably need to be increased in time because stuff grows on the inside of the pipes and the tubes, and you need to increase the flow a little bit in time. The reason you want the minimum flow is because you want the water in contact with the pellet for the maximum amount of time. If you rush the water through, it has no time to get the nutrition from the pellet. So you want the minimum flow that keeps all of the pellets fluidized. Now we move over to the high phosphate level. This is where your phosphate, we consider the optimum phosphate level to be about 0.1 ppm, anywhere down to about 0.04 or 0.03 ppm, anywhere in there. This is if you're above that 0.1 ppm. You need more aggressive carbon dosing. So you're going to use the Alima NP. Alima NP is the most aggressive of our carbon dosing products. You're going to use it, again, above 1 ppm, uh, 0.1 ppm, sorry, of phosphate. And you're going to keep an eye on things. And by the way, if you're starting carbon dosing in a system that has never had carbon dosing, please start with like a quarter of a dose and use a few months to work your way up. And watch how your tank reacts and listen to what your tank is telling you. Keep in mind, the bad guys in the tank want the same conditions the good guys do. So sometimes if we have a deficit in the tank and we fill the deficit, sometimes the bad guys peek their heads up. It means there was a deficit. You're doing the right thing by what you're adding, but you've also given the bad guys a good thing. So that's really in relation to trace elements, but it's somewhat true of carbon dosing as well. So if you're going to start carbon dosing in a tank that's never had it, just like if you're starting trace elements in a tank that have never had it, start with a quarter of a dose and use three or four months to work your way up to the dosage. So 0.1 ppm or above, you're going to use a limit NP. Now, if we're in the desirable range, 0 .0, 0 0.1 down to about 0.03 or 0.04, you're going to use the NP Bacto Balance. The reason it's called NP Bacto Balance is because it's going to balance that phosphate nitrate ratio where you want it. It's going to give you the carbon dosing, but it's also going to add some nitrates and phosphates so that as we bring the nutrient level down, we don't bring it too far down. 
So it's going to do carbon dosing, but it's also going to add some of those essential nitrates and phosphates that we need. The red part, again, 0.03 up to about 0.1 ppm. Try to maintain it there. NP back to balance. It's easy to remember. Elim NP, you're eliminating it. Balance, you're keeping it where you want it. Then we have your phosphates are way too low, below 0.03. I like to see people go below 0.04, actually. Now we're talking about plus NP. Also, you're eliminating, you're balancing, or you're plus, you're adding. The plus NP is going to add only a very little of the carbon dosing, but it's going to get more aggressive in adding the nitrogen compounds and the phosphates. Uh, with plus NP, keep in mind that it's going to take a while for the nitrogen compounds to show up because the kind that we add also go more directly to the coral polyp instead of turning into nitrates in your water column. So they lag a little bit in the showing up. So just to review, if you want to increase your phosphate level, you're using the plus NP. If you want to balance that phosphate level because it's in a good range, you're using the NP back to balance. If you need to bring your phosphate level down, you're going to use the elim NP. And if you would like to get even more benefit for your corals from the carbon dosing, you're going to use the NP back to pellets or the refactif, which by the way can be used along with any one of those other three products at any phosphate levels. Uh, one last comment about those products. If uh, people always ask me, well, does that mean if I'm using the NP back to balance and my phosphates go down to 0.03, that I'm going to switch over to the plus NP? Yes, that's exactly what you do. And by the way, if that happens, what I've learned is don't switch back to the NP back to balance the minute you get back to 0.04 because there's going to be a little bounce back. So let it go up. If you're trying to come up because you drop too low, let it come up to maybe 0 0.05, 0 0.06 before you switch back to the NP back to balance because there's going to be a little bounce that happens. Same thing is true if you're coming down from up above. You know, if you switch over to the um, Elima NP, I know, switch over to the Elima NP, um, let yourself get down further into that desirable range. I'm afraid my time is up and I don't have a lot of time for questions because I want to give stuff out to people. So, booth 323, I encourage any of you or all of you.